here, Brian, and there are plans to expand the indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our state. Well, that's not how this works. Well, hello there and welcome to Nowhere to Hide. I'm Brian Hyde. Happy to sit down with you a couple times a week to uh, help point out some of the inconsistencies as well as some of the outright deception and shading of the truth that uh, much of our corporate media seems uh, more, to, more than happy to engage in. And I've got some doozies to get us started this week. Our topic is going to be poisoning public perception. And I'm not just going to point out the problems. I'm going to also offer some solutions that you and I can undertake to minimize the effect of that poison on our own thinking. So with that, let's begin with a headline from the uh, Idaho Capital Sun. I know that uh, the library bill that would keep salacious materials out of reach of underage children has generated no small amount of controversy. And I want you to see how this is spun into, well, this is an attack on librarians as opposed to, you know, this is, this is an objection to putting very sexually explicit material in front of kids in some misguided attempt to either manipulate them into experimenting with this kind of stuff or just normalizing a lot of different types of deviancy for the sake of these young minds. So the, the headline tells us Idaho librarians contemplate leaving work and the state as a result of proposed legislation. Now, this is an informal survey conducted by the Idaho Library Association. I think they talked to 130 different librarians. 60% of the respondents say they're considering leaving the profession. All right, well, let's dig a little bit deeper and see what this story can tell us. In recent years, conservative groups have scrutinized Idaho libraries for programs or literature connected to the LGBTQ plus community. Instances include religious protesters in North Idaho objecting to a library program for LGBTQ plus teens, Mass Resistance, a national anti-LGBTQ group protesting a drag queen storytime event at a Pocatello library, and the Idaho Lib Liberty Dogs, rather, a far-right group, we're warned, protesting books on, same, uh, on sex education in the Meridian Library District. Now, I've shown these, I've shown examples of the photographs and the, and the kinds of images that are promoted by these books so many times on this program, and, and I'm tired of showing it just because it's, it's like they pretend like this doesn't exist, or if it does, it's totally normal and good. Teaching kids how to perform anal sex and oral sex and how to experiment, how to masturbate, how to question their own gender or to perhaps uh, try a different flavor of deviancy, you know, just to, to be different. They have no place being accessible, especially in publicly funded entities like school libraries or public libraries. They don't need to be accessible to kids. Now, granted, there are adults who may want to avail themselves of that kind of information. None of these books are banned. The whole point is just simply keeping them out of the reach of young, impressionable minds, which in a simpler time, meaning even just 10 years ago, that wouldn't have raised so much as an eyebrow. But today, oh, wow, that's that's terrible. It's, you know, these librarians, they, they, they want to they want to leave. So let's let's see what uh, what it really comes down to. The spin here. And this is uh, courtesy of Aaron Kennedy, who is the intellectual freedom chair for the Idaho Library Association based in Boise says she spent part of her childhood in Cascade, where she would spend her teen years at the Cascade Public Library. Kennedy said rural libraries would be most in impacted by fines in library-related legislation. It's very simple to avoid the fines. You don't need to reinvent the entire wheel here. All you have to do is make sure that these kinds of books are kept out of the reach of underage kids. Very simple. Well, the way the bill is written, Kennedy said, children who are LGBT LGBTQ plus or have families with LGBTQ plus members will be disproportionately affected. That's a big segment of our community that's not seeing themselves reflected at the library. And in fact, they're being told that their identities are not appropriate. Okay, I hate to be the guy who has to be the heavy here, but if your identity is based on whatever sexual act you seem to find the greatest happiness in, you should probably rethink what your identity really is. Human sexuality is, is a complicated matter, and it's a, it's a very strong matter in the sense that people can become fixated on things that are entirely inappropriate or unnatural or even just obsessive. But we don't need to make that material available to kids. And, it's, and I, have to, I have to point this out. You know, she, she talks about how uh, they, they worry that they're not going to be told that their identities are appropriate and they're not seeing themselves reflected at the library. Well, you know where else they are seeing themselves reflected? Pretty much every bit of mass entertainment, mass media, uh, popular media, music, etc., corporate America, parades, everything. I mean, 
they're not seeing themselves represented. Oh my goodness, why they're about to vanish from existence. Hardly. Anyone who's lived through the month of June through September, which is now uh, morphing from Pride Month into Pride uh, Era, can tell you that, look, when you, have, when you have basically all of the media, most of political organizations or institutions, and, and corporate America on your side, you are hardly a persecuted minority. Again, this is a very clever pivot and deflection away from what is appropriate versus what is not appropriate for underage kids. Nobody's telling adults, if that's how you want to get your jollies, knock yourself out. In fact, people have done this pretty much for time immemorial. The, the difference is they kept it to themselves. There were some things that were kept private. I think it was uh, Sir William Blackstone who talked about how, look, vices are mistakes that people make in their search for happiness. Wait, that was Lysander Spooner. What Blackstone said was, vices do not need to be the subject of public law until you bring them out into public. In other words, he used the example of a man is a drunkard in his own bedroom. Primarily, he's the only one who's being affected, and therefore, the public laws have no hold over him. But when you bring your vice or you bring your particular perversion or fetish out into the public and demand that everybody else respect it and honor it as part of uh, recognizing who you are, I'm sorry, not only is that narcissistic, but it's wrong. And sadly, it's now appropriate that uh, we have the power of the state intervene to set boundaries and say these are things that will not be crossed. If you do cross this, they're talking, what, a $250 fine to uh, to put things right or to motivate uh, librarians not to make this kind of material readily available to underage kids. But isn't that uh, just sweet, the whole idea of, well, but they're going to leave the state. They're going to march right out of here if if, if people don't, uh, don't kowtow to, to their demands. Look. If people were demanding this, that would be one thing. But the people who are demanding it are a tiny, tiny segment of the society, which for some reason has mistaken their credentials for the grand poobah of all creation. And they believe that unless people are validating them with every breath they take, somehow that's the equivalent of we're trying to silence them or we're trying to, to uh, relegate them into nothingness. Look, again, I, I don't mean to be rude. Whatever brings you happiness, as long as it's peaceful and it's between adults, that is your business but don't bring it out into the public and expect everybody to acknowledge you and pat you on the back and tell you how great it is. You don't have the right to force people to do that. You certainly don't have the right to try to indoctrinate, indoctrinate their children into believing that this is all good and normal and boy, it's probably something you know they should be participating in as well. How sad that we have to speak so bluntly, but I, I'm just telling you, what you do to find your sexual satisfaction is your business. You should keep it your business and not make it everyone else's business. It doesn't improve our lives in any way. And as you're starting to find out, some of you who have been especially vocal, I'll be damned if you're going to do that to my kids, if you're going to try and teach them that that's good and normal. All right, let me hop off the soapbox. We'll move on to another topic here. Oh, look, KTVB assures us that America's economic outlook is brightening as inflation slows and wages outpace prices. Okay, I got to ask you, are are you really feeling like, oh, yeah, things have gotten so much better? I mean, I have seen gas prices come down a little bit, but that still doesn't offset the sticker shock every one of us feels every time we go to the grocery store. In fact, I want to I want to turn to Mike Meharry writing for uh, <clears throat> Money Metals Exchange. He has got some great insights here, starting with the powers that be claim rising prices don't actually hurt the average person because wages rise along with prices. And Mike says, yes, you have to pay more for everything, but ostensibly you're earning more, so it's a wash. You're no worse off. Now, he says, of course, you know you're worse off because you're living it. And he says the data proves it. So here's how that works. The truth is earnings rarely rise at the same pace as prices. Wages almost always lag significant, significantly. That means price inflation puts a significant squeeze on your pocketbook, at least in the short term, until or if your earnings catch up. And if you happen to be somebody living on a fixed income or savings, you're really screwed as inflation rapidly eats away your purchasing power and your income streams don't increase at all. In fact, he comes right out and tells us price inflation always causes the most pain for the poor and elderly. But the government people and their supporting cast in the media and academia need the inflation tax, so they try to tell you that everything is fine. And this is one more reason why it's so difficult to trust the media on, on not just this, but, but a number of different topics. In fact, uh, 
here's here's something that I don't know. Last I talked about this a couple of episodes ago about how the Idaho statesman was laying off a big chunk of their workforce. Well, this week it's the Los Angeles Times laying off more than 130 journalists. And I know it's it's not right to celebrate and to take glee in somebody else's misfortune. But I do I do appreciate Frank Fleming's observation. I can't believe the reaction I'm seeing to journalists losing their jobs. A lot of people are celebrating the misfortune of people who wanted nothing more than to report the facts and occasionally destroy anyone opposed to their politics. So if you wonder, where does that animosity towards the, the media or towards journalism in particular come from? Well, there you go. There's a big pregnant hint about where it comes from. These are the people who, you know, printed headlines like, it may, uh, it may be ghoulish to celebrate the deaths of the unvaccinated, but it may be the right thing to do. Do you really think you could, you know, print headlines like that and then just sit back and expect everybody to support you in your moment of need? I'm sorry, but, you know, karma is exact. And this may be one of those cases where what goes around comes around. You know, I feel bad for their dependents. I feel bad for the people who depend on them to bring home a paycheck. But if you were participating in that, uh, you know, being a, a, you know, an enforcer or an inflictor of social pain on the non-compliers, you kind of deserve what you get. So. You know, maybe go crying to somebody else. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about how the media poisons public perception. And for this, I want to turn to the great Paul Rosenberg. In a recent article, he talked about how we need to step away from the, the status quo. And he gives an example of why this is so. Citing a recent article in The Guardian, a major UK newspaper, responding to the protests of German farmers by declaring repeatedly that these farmers are refusing to pay for their pollution. That's their take. Now, he says the sanctimonious writer of those words expects farmers to grow immense amounts of food while never involving fields, fertilizers, or machines. This post and many like it are the ravings of neo-intellectuals who've never built anything, but who get ahead by tearing things down. Again, very descriptive of the journalist class. Reality is a non-factor in their pronouncements. And the people who accept such ideas then are sowing unreality into a brain that struggles constantly to recognize reality. So he says, I think it's quite fair to call this poison. Now he goes on to say, please try to grasp that the people promoting this kind of anti-reality anti will, if they can, destroy whatever stands in their way. These are the same people who wanted to deny medical care to anyone who dared disagree with them and were happy if someone who didn't comply with them died. That's how serious this is. These people have already demonstrated their willingness for non-compliers to die. That's the same psychology that drove inquisitors and their heretic hunts. The names and titles are new, but the pathology is the same. He says these people operate not by reasoning with you, but applying social pain. Their job is to sow the terror of being shamed and rejected and punished, and their floggings are to be delivered not by policemen, but in a far more intimate and effective way, by employers, co-workers, families, neighbors, Facebook groups, and so forth. The present situation, he says, is one that is, is that one establishment narrative after another has crashed and burned over the past several years. And what remain usable to the establishment then are dogma, outrage, and a hard disconnect from reality. Social pain must be well applied, or well enough applied, rather, that most people never refer to anything outside their sphere. And he says, that's not just my opinion. However much they may deny this, their actions belie their words. Now, the solution he offers here is very simple. What would you do with pollution? What would you do with poison? And the obvious answer is you step away from it. Reduce your exposure to it in your life. Now, I do agree that there are ways to tell the tale. Memes are a particularly effective way. For instance, here's the FBI releasing a terrifying image of domestic terrorists at work. Yo, you may think that's that's uh, exaggerating things, but have you have you seen what the FBI's criteria is for you know making people suspect? That's exactly the kind of imagery that would put them on a, eh, we're not too sure about them kind of list. All right, moving on to another topic here. This is a tool that I think you're going to find very helpful, especially since the Idaho legislature is in session. And I know there's a lot of talk about how do, uh, how do legislators really perform? I mean, there are different systems out there, different indexes that rate how they vote, whether their votes are supportive of, you know, freedom or uh, commerce or so forth. Well, in an effort to increase Idaho voter education, Think Liberty Idaho has compiled legislator scores into one easy to navigate table. Now, here's the beauty of what they've done. Here you find the 2023 scores of each legislature from Idaho Freedom Foundation, also 
those who were ranked by the American Conservative Union, Institute for Legislative Analysis, and the Idaho Association of Commerce and Industry, or IACI. So you can also see if they signed the Citizens Alliance of Idaho Pledge or if they're a member of either the Main Street Caucus or the Idaho Freedom Caucus. And the best thing of all is you can search by legislator name as well as by district. So I picked uh, I picked Linda Hartgen as, as a good example of what this looks like simply because she is one who runs as a common sense Republican. And that's that's how she bills herself. But look at how she scores with the Idaho Freedom Foundation. She's got a pitiful 39 point or 37 point nine percent score. She scores 63 with the American Conservative Union. The Institute for Legislative Analysis, this is the one that did the study a few weeks ago that talked about, uh, you know, those who ostensibly vote uh, Republican or who act Republican, but uh, but vote Democratic. And then you have the Idaho Association of Commerce and Industry, and the, then it talks about her caucus membership. She's a member of the Main Street Caucus, which is cover for, look, we're just like everybody else, except that we pretend to be Republican and vote Democratic. Has she taken the Citizens Alliance of Idaho Pledge? The answer is a resounding no. And if you want to check out each legislator from the last legislative session, you can go to thinklibertyidaho.org. Very, very simple. Now, here's another warning. This coming to us from Nicholas Kleinworth from the Idaho Freedom Foundation. As uh, budget appropriations are taking place, as spending is taking place, he warns that the blue wave in Idaho will come in the form of handouts. And he says, beware of those who propose more government as the solution to the ills of society. By the way, here's a chart that, that shows why that concern is very well founded. Nationally, Democrats see big gains among voters on welfare. Look at that. The, the Democrat margin, 32.6% among those voters who are currently on welfare. You can see the incentive that's at work here. Why well, I want to vote for those who are, are giving me the most benefits. So let's now take a little uh, detour into the story about Medicaid you've not heard. This is from Fred Birnbaum from the Idaho Freedom Foundation. And, and this will tell you why it's so important that you have legislators who hold the line on government spending and don't just rubber stamp whatever budget comes before them. Fred reports breaking news you won't get from the legacy media. Conservatives in the Idaho legislature were correct to reject Idaho's two separate Medicaid budgets last session. Why? The Medicaid department is sending back or reverting $278 million to the general fund, meaning that the budget was over-appropriated. To put that error in perspective, consider that the error is nearly three times the total budget for the Idaho State Police. That's astonishing. He says it's too bad that the government kept this money for a year instead of returning it to taxpayers. Medicaid is Idaho's largest single government program and has the largest budget of any program. At nearly $4.7 billion for fiscal year 2024, it represents 34% of the entire state budget for all programs, including all federal funds. So you would think that this budget would get the most scrutiny. The history is that apart from a couple of close votes, including in the 2021 session, when Senate Bill 1185 to fund Medicaid at, at $3.7 billion, it hasn't. The Medi that Medicaid bill passed the House by a margin of only 36 to 34 for the fiscal year 2022 budget, but that budget has now grown by nearly a billion dollars in two years. Now, here's the crazy thing. As part of the fiscal year 2024 budget review, the Medicaid department and governor re recommend a rescission or reversion of nearly $278 million to reduce the current fiscal year 2024 Medicaid budget. So the final budget for fiscal year 2024 is likely to be over $400 million lower than the original agency request and the governor's recommendation. The reason for the reduction is simple. Thousands of people were on Medicaid who were not eligible and a proper budget should have reflected this. Now, surely someone would have sounded the alarm if that were the case. Well, actually they did. Only three members of JFAC held out in the final vote for a lowered budget. That was representatives Tanner, Lambert, and Senator Herndon. So when the debate begins on the fiscal year 2025 budget, those three legislators on JFAC and all the other conservatives who voted against the budget absolutely have the edge when it comes to credibility and guardianship of your tax dollars. Not to rub it in, but he says they were right all along. That's why you need to be paying close attention to what's going on within the legislature. And as luck would have it, there's just such an opportunity coming up. In fact, if you want to check this out tomorrow at noon, it's uh, Capital Clarity. The Idaho Freedom Foundation is proud to announce the next lineup for the Capital Clarity program for Thursday, January 25th, 12 noon in the Lincoln Auditorium. This is where Senator Galenita Ziderfeld and Representative Josh Tanner will share their efforts to hold the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare accountable to the legislature and to the people. 
And you can join them either live in the Lincoln Auditorium or online at YouTube, Facebook's X, Facebook X, or CapitalClarity.com. If you need to learn more, you can always go to IdahoFreedom.org. Look, it sounds like hyperbole to say, yes, the media is trying to poison the public's perception. But I've given you some pretty solid examples where that's exactly what they're trying to do. If you want to remain grounded in reality, you got to be willing to do the hard work. And, and thankfully, you have some amazing tools now to work with you. So consider using those tools. Consider being a healthy skeptic. And I'll see you on the next episode of Nowhere to Hide are biased, the Idaho Press Club are biased, all media, newspaper, radio. To be completely blunt here, Brian, and there are plans to expand indoctrination. That's right. Well, Idahoans are also concerned. Horror shot. That line would be moving a little bit farther west. I'm like crying. Nobody wants to Dark see. Dark money is influencing policy in our